this class is an interesting one in that um, it's, it's a course that a lot of psych students like don't really understand why you have to take it. Sort of, um, a lot of times I think people get into social sciences and other things to get away from things like math. And the one thing that I want to um, hopefully get, get across well through the course of this session is that this is not a math class, it's not at all. I mean, you're going to see things like equations, things that like look like math, but it really, the focus of the course is not really the math. Um, it's really about sort of how to make decisions about evidence that you find as a researcher, even though you may not plan on being a researcher, it's just that the idea of being able to look at information and be able to make um, informed decisions about them. So this class is a lot more about decision making and the process we go through to sort of make those decisions. And yes, we use some equations and yes, there's some things that appear math-like, but it's really not very much about that. I mean, it's um, in fact, the equations at some point may become the part that you think is the easier part in terms of being able just to plug numbers into things. That stuff becomes fairly easy. It's sort of like um, analogous to baking or something. It's like following instructions and in the end, you get an answer to an equation or something instead of a cake, which is not nearly as fun. But the process is sort of the same. It's just putting in ingredients and getting an answer. It's the, it's the why we do this stuff. The, um, the, the theory and stuff behind it that actually may be more complicated that we need to spend some time sort of going over. But the equations end up not being very difficult at all. At least I hope. So a lot of times people um, will assume that I'm some kind of math, uh, math geek or math person. I never would have thought that growing up. I'm like, no, I wasn't very math oriented. But um, it's because I, I don't really approach this as math. It's sort of like problem solving for me. And I like problem solving. I like puzzles. So, um, you know, you don't have to be a math person to really sort of get an appreciation for this stuff or to understand it. Um, and, a lot, and, and in fact, I've had math students, students like from the math department have taken some of these stats courses and they, have, they actually have issues trying to understand how to, how to apply this stuff to real data. So there's a, a weird mix, uh, you know, mix mismatch between, uh, it's not, there's some math in it, but it's not really super math, uh, math oriented. It's really more about problem solving, being able to apply some of these equations to, to data. Okay. That's why I put here, you know, I get a lot of this sort of response of like, oh, yeah, why do I have to take this class? Um, and it's really to try to make you better informed sort of consumers of psychology as opposed to just listening to anything that anyone tells you about, uh, about research and things. So first thing, sort of, you know, a little bit about me. Who am I? So I, I graduated from CSUN. Matter of fact, the... the uh, the semester that I started at CSUN was the fall semester of 94, which was, you know, roughly six months after the earthquake. So I lived in um, the valley when the earthquake, you know, when the earthquake happened. And I remember all this stuff. This was like the, the parking structure over by the, by the dorms. Um, this is right at, I think, um, Zelza, not Zelza, um, Lindley. And uh, Reseda, the, the sign was there saying that, you know, the semester will open because everything was now in these trailers. So the first couple of years that I was here, I didn't set foot in a building. Every class I had was in one of these trailers and they were all, any place you see grass on campus, uh, except for right in front of the library, I think. I think that was, there was no classes there. Everywhere else there were classes. I think actually maybe there were classes in front of the library. Like they covered every single piece of grass on campus with uh, these sort of, trailers and we took classes in those the air conditioning sucks so when it was hot it, it was like they were like ovens you can see sort of parts of the library here that had sort of collapsed and they had to rebuild some of it um another picture of the structure there this was actually the the library annex that they had opened up so they moved a bunch of stuff from the building into this big dome and these domes also were all over the campus too um like admission and records was in a building and i remember this is back and this is back before registering for classes online, even back before what they called touch tone registration, when we did it through the phone. You literally had to go and stand in line in front of one of these these big domes to go and like register for classes. You would like fill out a piece of paper, you would turn it in, they would tell you you know if, if classes were full or not, and you had to make a decision, you had to have like alternates ready, and you'd go and like literally talk to somebody about doing that. And, and it sounds like I'm talking about the old days, but this is like 1994. It wasn't like it was the 50s or something. This was like literally not that long ago. And um 
it's, it's not that long after that we started doing touch tone registration where you call a number, you would like tile in the number of the class you wanted to, to register for before everything sort of went online. This is sort of the, what do you notice about the, the this is the library not that long after the earthquake. And you notice anything different about it? Anything strange? Yes. Yeah. So when, when um, so on my, on my diploma, so my, so when I, so it's actually long after that, when, when I graduated, I, I guess I have, I graduated from CSUN with a, with a, with a BA in psych, and then I also got a master's here in psych, and I went to UCLA for a PhD. My, when I finished my PhD, my parents wanted to, um, you know, like frame all my diplomas. Like that was me. I was like, whatever, they're in a box someplace. But they, they, that was something they wanted to do for me graduating. And they did it with these diplomas, and they also had pictures, like these, uh, paintings like um, for uh, UCLA, it was like Royce Hall as a sort of painting. They came up with the thing, and then for CSUN, it was the OVI library. But when we, when we were talking about it, I said, "Well, if you're going to have it painted, or, or if the, whatever the place is doing it, it's got to be the old version of the library because the new one had the stairs." And when I graduated from uh, in front of the library, they actually had to build a stage. Uh, here every year to graduate because there were no stairs to get into the library it's sort of misleading it actually looks like there's a walkway you just walk right in the library you couldn't uh, this actually you'd walk into the basement of the building so to get in you had to go up and around the sides there were no stairs in the front it was really an odd thing and they so they finally changed that but this was what the library looked like when i was a student here anyway um so, like, like I said before, I went to UCLA after that. Um, so I'm a UCLA alum as well. Uh, this is a this is a picture of uh, Franz Hall where um, I spent most of my time. This is this. I don't know if you've ever been to UCLA. This is a thing called the the inverted fountain. Uh, this is sort of a dark picture, but um, where all the water flows from the side down towards the middle. So, so instead of a fountain that shoots up, it comes from the side and everything rolls down. Um, I started full time in the psych department in 2006, and since then, I you know I started the the tutoring center in the psych department that later sort of grew into the college tutoring center, and then I started uh, with some colleagues from sociology and social work and education and uh, health and human development. We started a sort of research center, research and evaluation center that is still going today. So I spend half my time sort of I'm now the director of this center. And spend half my time doing that, and that the evaluation center is. I sort of help uh, folks with grants um, that are doing programs. Like if you heard of, um, there's uh, the Camino program. I think that's just wrapping up. That's over in health and human development. There's the Build Put Air program that's been going on for. We're going into the seventh year that I've been working as an evaluator for. Lots of programs like that that are, are meant to help students and do student programming to help students sort of. Uh, graduate and move into grad programs, that sort of thing. So I've been uh, I'm involved in lots of different things on campus. And on the sort of fun or more fun side, um, I'm just, sorry, these are all kind of dark pictures. If I stand here, you can see, no, not really. The, um, this is a picture of me playing the guitar, and this is me when I had long hair, learning to hula dance. And these are a bunch of faculty and students, a whole bunch of us sort of singing and stuff. This is me and my son a few years ago. So I don't know how old he is here, but this kid right now is 14. So this is, you know, um, older, but we've done this every year. This So Psychology's Got Talent Show to sort of raise money for a scholarship that we do. So there's, you know, not just all stats and sort of boring evaluation research stuff. I do have a side that is a little bit more creative. And um, matter of fact, this was the the career that I saw myself going into is actually to be a musician and stuff. And you know, just life decided differently for me. But um, did we actually been to or at least heard of this um, the Sykes Got Talent show? Actually, switch this up or been to it maybe. Well, I mean, it's it's done every year. I got to figure out how that'll work. This next semester, this is usually in the fall, like somewhere around, um, usually a, you know, a few weeks before Halloween or something, October. I don't know how that's going to happen this year because uh, the pandemic and stuff, but 
hopefully I'll be able to do something and figure out something that will work and hopefully allow us to sort of raise money for the scholarship again. But um, so any questions about me or anything else that we've talked about here before we move on? So here's a, an important thing I'd like to ask at the beginning of the semester um, is just so I can help either confirm or deny things that you might have heard, what have you heard about me you know, as an instructor or about the class? And hopefully I can at least maybe address some of the things. Um, has anybody heard anything? Because sometimes I guess maybe no news is good news, but what have you heard about me or the class before this? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I remember you, even when I was a, an undergrad and I had to take this course here, um, my, my experience was a little bit different. I, I, um, I took it, I took 320 and 321 together at the same time with the same instructor. It was actually designed that way. It was a block course where you took both classes together in the same semester. It seemed like a no brainer. I'm like, oh my God, I can knock out both those classes at the, at the same time. It just happened to be with one of the hardest uh, professors that had ever had ever been in this department. So it was it was interesting. I think a lot of the gray hair I had was from that particular semester. Um, I was trying to sort of do both of them, probably the most difficult classes to to get through in general in the major, but also with a very very tough, very strict instructor. But in, at the same time, I think it's actually what solidified my. Um, my sort of knowledge and stuff of the of the course. I, I eventually ended up becoming the professor's sort of TA, and uh, I got a letter of recommendation um, from you know from the professor as well. So it ended up working out, but man, it didn't seem like it at first. It was like murder at first. But anything else? I mean, part of this is me trying to, to, to get you to interact, so it makes it normal. I mean, so it gets you used to sort of being able to ask questions or answer questions and not worrying about things. One trick, too, that's interesting uh, with Zoom, if you don't know, is if you're muted and you want to just say something real quick, you can just hit the space bar. And the space bar sort of works sort of like a walkie-talkie. Like, you just hold it down. You can then talk for a second, and as soon as you let it go, you're muted again. If you want to say something quick, let's try it out. Tell me something you've heard about the class before. Use the space bar and check it out. Okay. That's a, a yeah. Being worried about the sort of online aspect of it, especially during right now, is a legitimate concern. And it's, it's not a concern that, that only you have. I am too. Like I'm worried about how do I get this stuff across to you? How do I make this class, you know, interesting and engaging and stuff in this format? It's just one of the reasons why like I'm doing this. I could be right now at home in my, in my, uh, in my pajamas, you know, just doing this through Zoom and, uh, you know, that stuff and, and not bother this. I think I'm, I'm actually doing this because I think this actually will make it a little bit more engaging. At least I hope it will. Um, and even as sort of recorded lectures, you're walk, walk, you know, watching it back later on, you have the chance to at least have a more engaging sort of content as opposed to just uh, like you, you can see the, the lectures I've done before. I just simply just recorded myself, recorded the screen while I was going through a lecture in class and it covers the same material. It just doesn't seem as engaging. The sound is not that as good because I'm walking around in class and stuff. So I'm hoping this would be a lot better of an approach. And like I said, in the very beginning, um, that uh, one of the things that, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to do is err on the side of sort of being flexible and, and being sort of understanding. Um, so, like you know, moving the classes, sorry, the classes, the, the exams online, um, where you're going to have you know a, you know a couple of days with which to start and sort of complete. You know, so once you start it, you have a you'll have a fixed amount of time to finish it, but you you can start it at any point within a window so that you can plan to have time when you have some privacy and some quiet and you have, you know, because everyone's got different schedules and things going on. So trying to, hopefully, hopefully trying to make this as flexible and, and as sort of forgiving because of the pandemic as possible. Anything else? So I, maybe I'll call you Kyle. What have you heard about the class? Just call you out by name. 
I mean, it's a prereq for pretty much everything. Out all the upper division courses, and stuff you have to, you know, a lot of them. There's, there's some elective courses you don't have to have this for, but um, a lot of them are, yeah. But yeah, so you've, you've, you're lucky and you're coming in with a clean slate. You have no, <laughs> no preconceived notions about or rumors about the course. Um, what about uh, Mary? Have you heard anything? I see a Mary over there. Do you have a microphone? Oh, psych, uh, not psych, math 140. That's great. So I, I, I'm, I'm actually like by nature super lazy and like, <laughs> like I'll try to do the, to find the simplest way to do things and try to, you know, make uh, life as easy for myself as possible. So if I don't have something like a course where I got to be there at a certain time and I have a regular schedule, it's easy for me to sort of slip into sort of not doing things. So one of the reasons why even though this class is sort of set up as a, an asynchronous course, I figured, well, originally it was set for this 930 to, to 1240 time. It's going to keep me sort of regular and sort of, you know, doing stuff um, consistently through the course. I'm hoping that students that can, can then log in and do the same thing. Yeah. What about uh, Michael? But yeah, you haven't had any heard any, any anything about the course. No one's telling you like, oh my god, don't take that course or don't take him. <laughs> right. Yeah, the the the, psych, the math one forty in this class are going to overlap some, but th this this. It's not you're taking it again so much as we're going to go sort of further into it, as a you know. So it's it's not the same course. It's just taking you further. Like the math 140 was a prerequisite prerequisite for this course, so that we can you know we could you could have some information at the beginning, so that as we start this course, you're not sort of clueless about things. So that's what why math 40 builds into 320, and then 320 then builds into 321, and then it's a lot of the prerequisite. The classes that this is a prerequisite for, the upper division courses, will talk about the use of stats and different research um, articles and methodology and stuff like that, that this will then help you to understand those topics. And so everything sort of builds on each other. Um, but I think, I think I didn't hear from Haley. Awesome. All right. So you, you haven't heard much. You're a transfer student. So that makes, that makes some sense. Um, just the, just things that I've heard, you know, that, that students have said before, just as a, as a, um, just to sort of clean slate things. I have a tendency, so students, things that students have complained about me before. I have a tendency to go sort of fast and I am a fast talking person by nature. It's my dad's side of the family. Everyone talks really fast. And believe it or not, my, um, when you hear me speaking fast in a lecture, like if I'm going quickly, that's actually me going slower, like slow for me. So it feels slow to me. So if I do go fast and if I'm, if I'm saying things too quickly and going, you know, too quickly through material, let me know. Just, uh, you know, raise a hand through Zoom, um, you know, interrupt and say, you know, hey, can you say that again? Can you please slow down? Um, Part of the issue, and I just as some, you know, upfront things. Growing up, I had a, um, a fairly moderate sort of stuttering issue. That I still have. I still have difficulty speaking sometimes. So there's times when I may say things in an odd way, or they may come out strange. And if you don't understand, just let me know, and I'll try to repeat it. So it's one of those things where I don't feel like because people are like, oh, I, ne I never really heard you stutter, and you don't stutter. I don't do it because I've sort of learned how to get around it, but um, and I feel like it's like a recovering or recovered or whatever recovering stuttering as opposed, as opposed to not being a stutterer anymore. But, um, you know, growing up, I rarely spoke in class, rarely spoke to people at all because uh, I had trouble getting words out. So I was like that typical sort of stereotype, you know, like uh, stuttering kid that like wouldn't really participate in class and stuff because I had a speech issue. So it's strange I've gone from that to now speaking for a living, uh, you know, for a living. But it's um, it's it's sometimes things just come out weird. Like one of the words that had that are the hardest for me to say that that I, I find my myself I find amusing is the word statistics, <laughs> which is the class that I have to teach and I have to say that word all the time, and it's sometimes it is the hardest word to get out. Statistics and distributions are another one. Distributions are a hard word to say. 
but um, you know, I've sort of practiced, got used to it. But so every once in a while, you'll hear me say an odd word or phrasing. It's that just um, things that my brain has sort of learned to do to sort of circumvent uh, getting stuck on words sometimes. But um, what else? So, uh, you know, people talk about this class being very difficult, and it sounds like at least one of you have taken the class before. And the, and the class can be, you know, can be challenging. It's, 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 oh, it's sort of teaching you to sort of rethink about things and sort of learn uh, a process that it may seem very unfamiliar. Um, and if, uh, the only thing I really recommend is, you know, I'm going to try to explain the material as best I can, but... Beyond that, you need to take the opportunities that are that are out there to. There's lots of practice problems that I'm providing you with. There's lots of. Um, there's going to be practice tests. There's going to be there's going to be practice quizzes. There'll be actual quizzes. Lots of places to practice because part of what the issue is with uh, a class like this is not just understanding the material, but you have to practice the material, like going through a t test and how to do a t test. You got to practice doing that so that you can learn to do it faster, more fluently, um, while sort of not making any mistakes. And that takes just sort of doing it and, and sort of getting used to doing it and being comfortable with the process of doing those those types of equations. Because many of them are multi-step sort of things. So it just takes it just takes practice. Um, what else have I heard? Um, I can't think of anything else. Um, but the biggest complaint like in my evaluations is that I go too fast or, um, and I'll try not to do that, but if I do, let me know. All right. Unless there are any other questions or things you want to talk about, let's move on. Um, so enough about me. Why, why statistics? Like seriously, why? Um, in order for you and I, and sort of everyone else that's in, uh, psychology or in the social sciences and just science in general to sort of be able to have a conversation about things that we find in research and things that, that, that are discovered through um, the process of doing scientific research in a laboratory or in field research or whatever, we have to have a sort of common process, a common way of doing things so that we all can agree that what you or I sort of find or report in journals or report wherever, um, that we can all agree that it's you know that that we believe that we have some faith in what's um, that what we find that what we find to be sort of true or at least believable, and the the pandemic actually gives you a pretty good um, example of sort of how the process works. And sometimes people get confused about the sort of scientific process, and it, it, not to get into a whole heated debate, you know, political debate about things, but we're talking about sort of wearing masks in public because of the pandemic. One of the things that, that you hear people who, on the side of not wanting to wear masks is that early on, um, sort of, you know, uh, the SO, experts in the field said, you know, oh, wearing masks is, you know, it's not really helpful. And in fact, it could be, it could be, you know, less healthy because of, you know, a number of reasons. And then later, the experts sort of changed their story. They said, oh, no, no, we, not, we should now move to wearing masks because of X, Y, and Z. And people see that sort of change in opinion or change in the story of experts to be uh, be a negative. It's like, oh, they, they don't see that they don't know what they're talking about. They keep changing their mind. When really, that's what sort of science should be about. As new evidence comes out, people do studies, and and uh, new evidence is made available. That should change our minds. Science is uh, all about like looking at new evidence and being able to change theories, change opinions about things because of new evidence and new methodology. So that, this class is sort of giving you a base for that kind of thing. How do you look at a research article or even an article in something like Science or some more mainstream you know, like magazine like? Um, journal that's geared more towards sort of lay people how do you you know read those things and sort of have a informed decision about the how you know how good or bad the the research was done i was going to say the word veracity the the veracity of the of the study um so this class is again less about statistics and more about the combination of how this these processes of, of doing the, of doing statistical analyses paired with the research methodology that's covered in Psych 321, how those two things together make you better informed, just 
citizens. You don't have to be a, a research scientist to sort of um, to, to to use some of these tools just to make better decisions about what you believe and what you don't believe. So this class is really about sort of giving you a common set of you know sort of skills so that you can actually go forward and take a class like. Um, social psychology as a capstone and as you're talking about different studies in social psychology be able to understand why they came to the conclusions they came to and then also just so that you are just a better informed uh, sort of citizen about sort of science and what is found in the medical community and other places just in general um, so this is giving you sort of the base of, of sort of decision making the processes we go through to sort of make those decisions so that we can actually all come to a common understanding so again, it's less about math, more about being informed, more about having sort of the right tools and understanding of things. All right. So, I'm gonna tr so as we talk about different um, types of analyses, I try. I tend to focus. By the way, I should mention this in the last slide. Um, I know the students complain that I spend too much time explaining the sort of why we do things, talking about the sort of background and giving the 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 sort of background on why t-tests are done the way they, they are because to me just telling you how to do a t-test and be able to you know plug some numbers in and, and come to a, an answer isn't the goal of the course is sort of understanding why that that process actually leads us to make a decision for or against you know the, the conclusion of a study so i'll spend a lot of time talking about this stuff and trying to give you the the sort of a, a base for understanding all these sort of crazy or seemingly crazy things that we do um, <clears throat> so one another sort of answer to this is going back to still the why statistics so there there are this is an uh, interesting quote there are three kinds of lies lies damn lies and statistics people will use statistics and research methods and that kind of stuff to spin stories in lots of different ways um, there was a, a book that was written, I think, I think it was like in the 50s. It's been around for a long time. It's called How to Lie with Statistics. And it was basically almost sat satirical in the sense of trying to point out ways in which people can use statistics to mislead um, the, the public to believe one thing or another. And, um, you know, here, this is from a while ago, but this is, you know, this is right around the time I think... Um, Donald Trump was just really starting into his his, uh, his presidency, and just and it still hasn't really gone away. This whole idea about sort of fake news and making claims that um, you know newscasters and things were were misleading the public with fake news, and this whole idea of sort of how to spot fake news and this, even this you know just to pick on some hot topic things like the you know vaccine myths and other things and you know how do we actually read. Um, you know, posts like this or news articles about fake news, you know, how do you decide what is fake, real, you know, what should be believed, what shouldn't be believed? Um, and a lot of the public will use um, the wrong information sometimes to make that decision. And by that, I mean, they'll, they'll think about the speaker. So who is telling me the information is more important than what the information is itself. And that can be sort of problematic. You should be more critical about what anyone says. So whether you love Donald Trump or hate him, um, whether you love someone like Dr. Fauci or hate him or whatever it is, whatever your beliefs are, your beliefs about the content and what they're saying should be more about what is being said and not who's saying it. I think people rely a lot on the speaker instead of, you know, they, they look to, you know, is it coming from CNN or it must be true? Or is it coming from Fox News or it must be true? So they, they're looking at the source more than the person who's actually, I mean, sorry, the content of what they're actually saying and be able to look critically at what's being said as opposed to just looking at the, the surface of the speaker and other sort of things that, you know, are they saying, you know, the, the buzzwords that I like to hear as opposed to looking at the content? Because there, there, there are lots of times where there are politicians who I don't agree with as a whole, but I can still find things that they say that are true and that, that I agree with because of the content and disregarding who it is that is being said. And that's what's sometimes very hard to do, to sort of separate out the emotional part of the of that information from the factual part. And that's what sort of this class is more sort of looking at how do we look at the facts or or the process and actually come to some decision about what is true and what is false. Okay. Um, 
And this comes back to this thing too. So this, this, this is a tough one. So psychology and I think social sciences in general are taking a really, really hard look at ourselves in the past few years. This was in 2016. So maybe uh, even, even as, as much as 10 years where there's been a, this, I don't know, sort of thread of research sort of going back trying to replicate older sort of famous studies, landmark studies that have been done. And what they found over and over again is most of those studies cannot be replicated, uh, meaning that they do, they follow the same processes, they, follow, they do the same exact you know, procedures and things, the same types of analyses, and in the end, they can't find the same results which is problematic. What that's done is, is brought to light many, many things that have been problematic. Like, um, just by, like in, in, um, in Zoom, you can actually do a little thumbs up thing. How many are, you know, raise hand thing. Um, how many of you just that are here, you've heard the sort of Stanford prison experiment. All right. So that's a, it's a famous, famous study that gets sort of brought out like in every like intro psychology course and in social psychology classes about the power of conformity, right? Well, that's actually a particularly interesting one because it can't be replicated because it's not, um, it's not ethical to do so. And a lot of our uh, ethics criteria and things were decided because of studies like the Stanford Prison Experiment. But it's come to light that not only was the study, the first people were like, oh, it's totally unethical. Well, it turns out that it was all completely faked, that the, the guards were told how to act, the, the prisoners were told how to act, and it was uh, an attempt to, um, you know, to sway the you know, popular opinion about things like conformity and how, they, how conformity can lead to these very bad types of behaviors, but it was compl a complete forgery. And even though it's been sort of used as uh, like a staple, like a cornerstone sort of study for talking about conformity and social psychology, it's completely false. And they're finding out more and more that there's lots of studies that, have, that, that where that has happened because they can't replicate the findings. So when that comes out that it can't be replicated, well, then it turns out that a lot of the information was either faked or forged or all kinds of other stuff. It's, it's nuts. So why do I mention this? Because, again, the way statistics is used and handled can be used for sort of nefarious purposes to try to convince people that there is a, you know, a true finding that there's something going on in data when, in fact, it really wasn't there. So... We need to sort of be careful, sort of how you know how much weight we put behind these decisions using these methodologies. So all it really does is sort of help us to make decisions. It doesn't prove anything sort of concretely that can't be later disproved, like with replication studies. So why else? Um, we need to sort of understand how research works. So there's lots of people, students, faculty, administration, lots of people around the world that believe that the way that we teach, um, that, that what we can't agree in the way to which to teach these two sort of courses. Should you learn research methodology first and then learn stats? Or learn stats first and research methodology second? As a department, and lots of departments do this, we do it seemingly backwards because we, we teach you how to analyze data before we teach you how to collect it. Seems sort of odd. And the reason for that, though, at least in my opinion, is when you get to 321 and you collect, you learn how to collect data, well, then you can also analyze it. Because uh, it seems odd to teach someone how to collect data and be like, well, now you got it, but we can't do anything with it because you don't know how to analyze it yet. So you learn the sort of methods in this course so that you can collect data and apply them in the next course. So even though it seems maybe methodologically backwards, it really does make some sense to learn this stuff first before you learn to apply it in 321. So one of the things that gets confused a lot, and people, even you know, experts in the field sometimes misuse this, uh, this process. So we tend to talk about this sort of P is greater than or less than 0.05, this so-called significance level. And we want our significance level to be below 0.05. But what does that mean exactly? So this cartoon is sort of, is the first part of a, a bigger cartoon I'll show you in a second.
So you have this uh, woman runs in and says, look, jelly beans cause acne. And so they're like, okay, a scientist, go investigate. And so they go and investigate and they come back and say, look, we found no link between jelly beans and acne, but they're probably of greater than 0.05. So right away, this means they looked at, you know, whether jelly beans and acne are linked together and the probability that, that, they, that they are linked, right, the pro that, this, that there's a correlation is actually greater than 0.05 means that you could by accident get the, the, the results that they got, you know, 95% of the time. So it doesn't really, it's not very conclusive. It doesn't really tell us anything about the linkage between uh, jelly beans and acne. So people are like, all right, fine, that's great. Jelly beans and acne are not related, except the same woman says, well, I hear that it's only certain, a certain color that causes acne. So, all right, so they go back and they redo the study a bunch of times. So I know that the text kind of small, but it just repeats. It says right here, it says, we found, um, we found no link between purple jelly beans and acne. And it says between um, brown and pink and blue and teal and uh, salmon and, by the way, that sounds gross, salmon jelly beans, you know, I know it's a color, it still sounds gross. Salmon jelly beans, red, turquoise, magenta, yellow, gray, tan, um, cyan, and here it says green. So we found a link between green jelly beans and acne, P is less than 0.05. And then it goes through mauve and beige, lilac, black, peach, and orange. So they do all these studies, and then they report here, you know, in some news article, green jelly beans linked to acne, the 95% comfortable. What's the problem? with this sort of approach. Should we believe, based on this set of studies here, that green jelly beans are linked to acne? So one, we don't know what the research methodology is. That's a good point. We don't know how exactly they, they link these together. So what kind of, did they do some kind of blind, you know, double blind study? Was it, you know, how, how, how many things did they control for to get rid of those confounds, right? But even let's let's assume for a second that the research methods were were good. They, they did everything the way they're supposed to do it. It was like a double blind, you know, randomized controlled trial, all kinds of you know fancy research methodology sort of terms, all used, all great. And they did these, you count them, it's five, ten, fifteen, twenty. They did twenty studies and found that green jelly beans were linked to acne. What's the problem there? It comes back to what does P is less than 0.05 even mean? Now we should back up a little further. What does the P mean if P is less than 0.05? Some of you just came, just came right from 140. A couple of you, right? What was, what did you guys talk about P is less than 0.05? What was the P and P is less than 0.05? That's exactly right. This stands for probability. Was there more you want to say? I'm sorry. I, I, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm not meaning to... Yes. So sometimes I'm not um, intending to, to interrupt. I'm trying to just repeat back what you're saying so that it's on the recording. So um, I didn't mean to stop you. <laughs> so um, yeah, so P means the probability that the correlation, I'm assuming this is probably correlation, the correlation they found between acne and... Um, and jelly beans has a, a, a less than 5% probability of occurring by chance. Okay, so it, you're talking about, if you think about a, a bunch of correlations, I'm not going to get too technical, but you have a bunch of correlations that are, you know, varying somewhere around zero, right, zero, and it means that there's some cutoff point where we're saying I have to have a correlation above this point that gets into a 5% region. 5% probability, where the rest of this then is the, you know, is 95% of it. So that means that 95% of the time we can get correlations that vary around no correlations, zero, negative and positive. We, we can get those correlations 95% of the time and think, oh, these correlations aren't even remarkable. They're, they're, too, they're, they're too small to even think is meaningful. As we get past this point, we start to think, oh, okay, well, these correlations might actually be meaningful because they're large enough to be in this 5% region. Okay. But 
being less than 5% doesn't mean it's 0%. It means we still can get some correlations by random chance 5% of the time. So go back and apply that here. Knowing that now, does this green jelly bean thing seem very interesting anymore? If I were to do 100 experiments by chance, by, and, and where, where things were not related at all, 5%, so five of those experiments would be significant when they're not supposed to be. That's, that's sort of what alpha tells us, that there's a 5% chance of getting correlations in this region by just chance alone. Right? They just happen to be randomly correlated by, the, by uh, an amount large enough to be in this 5%. So out of 100 cases, I expect five. How many would I expect in 20? How often would correlations fall into this sort of 5% probability if I do 20 studies? One time. I would expect there to be at least one significant correlation that is there by strictly by chance just if I did 20 studies. So this one green jelly bean relationship is likely there just by chance alone because we did 20 studies. Now if I wanted to show the green jelly beans really did relate to acne, I would need to replicate it, do it again find the same results. Maybe even do it again a few more times, find the same results. Because if I'm doing 20 different studies, I have the same methodology, I would expect to get a, what's called a false positive, uh, to, to get a correlation large enough to, for us to consider it to be significant, even though really it's just random. So I would expect one false positive anyway. So this confirms that I'm getting potentially, this looks like it's more likely a false positive than anything else. But because it's the one correlation they find significant, they leave out the fact that they did 20 other studies and just report the one study where they found a link between green jelly beans and acne, which was really a false positive, and somebody else goes to replicate that later on and can't find it because this was just a random occurrence, just a chance occurrence that they can't replicate because it doesn't really exist. That makes sense? So part of what we're doing is learning sort of the process and sort of understanding why this is problematic, why doing research this way is not good. Um, that we need to think a little bit differently about how that 0.05 sort of value works. Yes, if we do a study and we get a significant result, it means that it has a less than 5% chance. But it doesn't mean we proved anything and that needs to be replicated. There needs to be more research done on that thing to sort of prove that it exists. All right, questions about that? If this doesn't make sense right now, that's okay, because that's what we're going to talk about more as we go forward. Leslie, question? Very last part about, oh, so the part of what we're going to do in the course is sort of to understand why when we do things like uh, do a study and we say, okay, well, the, the results have a less than 5% significance, that word significance is something that is misleading. It doesn't actually mean that we've proved the existence of this relationship. It just means, all right, this is the first step in which we've confirmed this, there's a possible relationship here through this, through this test, and that's going to have to be replicated in, uh, by, with other um, participants, with, in other scenarios, to sort of show that it is a consistent significant finding before anything can be proven, and we can actually show maybe some cause and effect relationships. That make sense? Okay, no problem. So a lot of you know a lot of what we're doing is you know we're we're doing these steps to sort of make decisions. It's leading us to sort of like okay, so think of this like a court case, right? So this is like Exhibit A. Exhibit A: the green jelly beans are linked to acne. All right, but Exhibit A is not going to be enough to convict the person or whatever you know whatever analogy you want to use for that. There's going to be more evidence than this. So this is just the sort of like the first step, first part of evidence that we're going to have to sort of then do more to, to really confirm that that actually exists. Okay. So in a bigger sense, I think it was maybe Haley that said that you're strangely excited about this class. The one thing I would say about, about stats and um, 
statistics in general, but in a, in a greater sense, sort of data science, being able to sort of, you know, look at a lot of data and be able to think, okay, I can make sense of this and not be sort of intimidated or, or scared of lots and lots of numbers. If you go through this course, and in the end, you decide that yeah, the bar can be pretty low. <laughs> you just decide that you just don't hate it, right? So you, just, you like there's hate down here, right? So you're above hating it. The chance that you actually could, you know, uh, potentially follow into a career of data science is pretty high because most people, when they when they are faced with statistics and math and and uh, data science type careers, they their immediate reaction is they they hate it. They have they, it's almost like a physical aversion to to the things because I, I was in that sort of boat I didn't get into um, my, my PhD is, is in quantitative psychology so I've I've gone through just a crazy and in, insane amount of stats courses in the career in my as, as a student and it didn't it wasn't because I loved stats and I loved numbers I was just like yeah it's not that bad that's literally that mentality was like eh, it's not that bad and I found myself to be in a fairly small percentage of students just because I didn't hate it and what that does is put me in a very small pool of people in which there is a lot of jobs available that makes sense I, I had colleagues uh, you know students I knew uh, as, a, as a grad student who were in social psych or clinical where it, they were going up for jobs or positions at, at universities like uh, as for gra as grad students where it was like 200 people competing for the same one position. When I got out of uh, the quantitative program, I was going out to jobs where there was like 10 jobs per person that are applying to them. There were so many jobs, so little people to fill them. So it was a much easier. I like those odds a lot better than the other way around. So I mentioned this because data science is a f massively fast growing field in which they're looking for more and more people. Places like Google and Amazon and you know Netflix and all these big companies that rely on data. And even like, even if you want to, if you want to get into it, the 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 Trump campaign, the 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 Democratic Party campaign for Biden, they're starting to to become any independents. Anybody that's sort of out there trying to do anything, are relying on collecting massive amounts of data and having people that that can actually uh, run the numbers and sort of give them answers. Uh, businesses turn what's what they call business informatics or business information um, to to rely more and more on these sort of. Um, uh, artificial intelligence driven sort of um, statistical procedures. So it's a fast growing, high paying field. More and more sort of women are going into this field. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a massive open blossoming sort of field that's gonna be growing for quite a while. Um, so again, if you leave this course and look at this material and think, yeah, I don't, I don't hate this, might be something to look into because that's really all you need is just a little bit of, of Unhate? I don't know what the word would be. You need a little bit of that motivation to go into it. You might find yourself, um, you know, going into a career that's actually going to take you quite a ways and make you a lot of money. Um, it does require some stats, but also combined with a little bit of computer science because because a lot of it is some programming as well. But uh, there was a recent study which I loved that it came out is that uh, they've tied. Um, coding and like uh, computer programming is more tied to sort of language, uh, language skills and comprehension than it is to sort of math ability. So I don't know. I, I thought I heard somebody, somebody coming on to say something. Maybe someone's microphone's just on. I thought I heard, it sounded like someone sort of like um, was uh, popping on to say something. Okay. So, questions about that? All right. So we're going to talk about a number of different things. We're going to go through measurement, displaying data. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about descriptives. So a lot of this stuff is going to be sort of redundant with some extra information and maybe a little more depth from the, the 140 class that you took. And then we'll go into sort of talking about hypothesis testing through a lot of different things. One sample through repeated measures. We'll talk about hypothesis testing and go through um, things like you know, testing relationships between things like correlation and regression. And I always, I always include chi-square as this sort of Opti optimistic sort of view that I have about it that we'll get here and oftentimes that I'm running out of time depending on how, how much time it takes to sort of go through some of these other topics. That's why I sort of put it at the end because it's the easiest one to sort of maybe teach yourself if you need to or I can um, maybe put a supplemental video about it um, 
because I think it's quite easy relative to sort of everything else. And the one thing that I always like is sort of perspective. Okay, so you know, students. I, uh, some of you mentioned like, oh, I gotta take stats again. I just took you know math 140, and now I gotta take this stats class again. This class is sort of uh, embedded in. To, uh, you know, again, there's this is this class is just so 140 is like just like sticking your toe in the water. Maybe not even your toe, like the tip of your toe in the water. 320 is now maybe sticking you know a couple toes in the water, right? And you start to learn that, apply that stuff. That's like 321. And then you can actually go even further, and there are capstones that are related uh, to to more stats, methods, more sort of tools in that toolbox. Um, 45 AD, this stands for archival data. So it's looking at data from like archive, like data that are in repositories. Like there's um, a repository in Michigan. They have a lot of health data. You can go and sort of, you can request data from them. They give it to you. It's a huge data set. You can go through and analyze stuff and publish papers based on their data. You don't have to even collect data. You can just analyze theirs. Um, there's uh, 485 US. US stands for univariate statistics. Uh, it's a class I've, I teach um, fairly regularly. I'm not teaching it this next year, but I, um, I taught it this last fall. Um, these are both sort of quantitative methods in psychology. We have other ones like this one that, again, furthers the, the, the idea but goes in a different direction. This one's called 45 GT. The GT stands for grounded theory. So this goes from, these two are sort of quality, I'm sorry, quantitative courses that sort of take this course further. This one then sort of takes a, I don't want to say a left turn, but it, it, it goes in a different direction and starts talking about qualitative methods, things like ethnographies and, um, you know, doing uh, how to code interviews and how to go through uh, documents and sort of code documents. And it's just a different approach to, um, to methods than the quantitative stuff uh, that is covered in, in these two courses, but it's still related and still sort of builds on the methodology that you, you learn in 320 and 321. So these, these are all undergrad courses up to the, cast, the capstone. These are the requirements, and then you, these are not requirements. So if you're looking at that thinking, I, there's no way in hell I'm ever taking a, a, a stats course after this one. By the way, I thought the same thing. Um, so just as a weird aside, and how, how life is sort of tricky sometimes. So I took 320 and 321 with this very, very, very strict professor. I hated every moment of it. Like, I, it was a miserable experience. Um, and I thought, there's no way in hell I'm ever taking another stats course ever again. Weirdly, um, a friend of mine, uh, this guy named uh, Patrick, this guy's friend I was friends with, um, his, he was, I think, a radio, television, and film major. And um, his girlfriend was a psych major. So I knew her, and we had some classes together. And she's like, hey, I'm taking this class at the time. 45 US used to be called 420. It's like 420. It was the same course. They just we relabeled it so we'd be part of this 485 sort of series and made it into a capstone. But she's like, hey, I'm taking this, you know, advanced stats course. Do you want to take it with me? I'm like, hell no, I don't want to take that class. There's no way in hell I'd ever want to take that another stats class in my life. And so she sort of, you know, bugged me about it for a little while. And she's like, just couldn't, you know, just sit in the first couple classes and see if you like it. And you know, I counted at that point as an undergrad, I counted as an elective. So I'm like, this, well, I'm, taking, I'm going to waste an elective on a stats course? No way. So I went with her, sat in the course. Um, after a week or two weeks, she dropped the course and I stayed. And a lot of that was because of the instructor. Her name was Linda Fidel, who um, is sort of famous from our psych department because uh, Linda Fidel and Barbara Tabosnik, two women, wrote this multivariate stats book, very advanced stats and methods, but it was in an applied sense. That's been one of the, you know, uh, most widely used and referenced books in that top on that topic um, all over the country and probably the world. So it was interesting. There, there are two women in a, in a, um, in a field where there weren't a lot of women. There's still not a lot of women in quantitative psychology or quantitative methods, but there were two and then they actually were sort of groundbreaking in a lot of ways. And I just happened to have one of them just happenstance that one, this friend of mine's girlfriend that I didn't know very well convinced me to sit into a class that I ended up staying into because the instructor was awesome. I ended up becoming her TA later on and uh, you know, and have come back and, and since taught the course that I thought there was no way in hell I'd ever take. Anyway, so again, so you never know how, where life's gonna take you. So 
once these courses go through, if you go, if you decide to go into a graduate program in psychology, so how many of you, again, by the thumbs up, want to go into a master's program or a PhD or something in psychology, or to go into a field that would require at least a master's? All right, Larry, Kyle, Mary. So, about Haley and Leslie, you guys, yes or no? I don't know. All right, maybe you guys aren't. So, if you are planning on going to a master's program, so our master's program in um, in psychology, we have uh, three uh, techniques. We have one that's through the same college in behavioral uh, psychology. Any master's program in psych is going to require at least one more course. So something akin to the Psych 485, this is what a class we require. The clinical program also requires this. And I say we because I'm in the psychological sciences uh, side. Psych science requires this, so does um, clinical. Behavioral science doesn't require this, but they do require uh, a different stats methodology looking at sort of single subject designs because of the, the nature of what they do. But you're going to, you know, go on to at least another. If you're going on to a PhD or something more advanced, expect to go even further and, you know, have a multivariate or some other course that's even going to be more advanced. So, um, this class we teach, I teach both these courses, teaching this 534, teaching in the fall. So these are sort of advanced graduate courses and multivariate stats. And this was in what's called latent variable modeling, which is another term for like factor analysis of that, if you've ever heard of that. But um, so this is sort of the series. So this is basically just, again, just the start. Well, 140 was sort of like the, the beginning. This is sort of the next step, but still a very small step and sort of a longer sort of road um, sort of ahead. Uh, of stats if you plan to going further into uh, the field.